Welcome to Accounting with Audra. In video four in a multi-part series on subpart F income. In video one, I highlighted various types of income streams that may generate subpart F income. In videos two and three, I explained the various exceptions to the rules. In this video, I describe the steps for how subpart F is actually computed. Once subpart F income is determined, essentially steps one and two of the computation, Treasury Regulation 1.954-1B provides special rules for further determining the adjusted amount of the deemed inclusion attributable to the identified gross foreign-based company income amount. U.S. taxpayers to do some analysis first on a gross income basis, and then they're to do an analysis on a net income basis. Let's walk through the final part, step three, which has several components. First, Taxpayers apply what are known as the de minimis and full inclusion rules to foreign based company gross income that we determined in our step one. The overall gross income amounts considered to be subpart F are compared to the total amount of all gross income earned by SAFC. In other words, our foreign personal holding company income and foreign based company sales and services income are then compared to the total amount of gross income. This comparison is done on a CFC by CFC basis. Let's first look at the de minimis rule. This rule says that if the sum of the gross foreign-based company income before taking into account any deductions and the gross insurance income for the taxable year of the controlled foreign corporation is less than the lesser of 5% of the CFC's gross income or a million dollars, then no part of the gross income for the year is treated as subpart F income. Better said, less than the smaller of 5% of gross income or a million. For example, if CFC has foreign-based company income of 525,000 and gross income of 4 million, 5% times that 4 million is 200,000. We then take the lesser of the 200,000 or a million dollars, which is in our case, the 200,000 for determining whether or not the de minimis rule applies to this CFC. Since the foreign-based company income of 525,000 is more than the $200,000 threshold, foreign-based company income in this example is not considered de minimis, and the full $525,000 will be considered foreign-based company income for the year. In example two, if CFC instead has foreign-based income of 525,000, and gross income of 24 million, then we take 5% of 24 million or 1.2. We use then the lesser of the 1.2 or 1 million, which in this case is the 1 million for determining whether or not the de minimis rule applies. Since $525,000 is less than a million dollars, the de minimis rule in this case does apply and none of the 525,000 is actually gonna be considered foreign-based company income for the year. The taxpayer does not need to do any further computation for the year with regards to this income. They can claim zero as subpart F. Looking at these two scenarios, scenario one, we don't need a de minimis. So we'll continue forward in going through our steps to determine our inclusion amount. In scenario two, we meet the test in other words, the Internal Revenue Code says, if your inclusion is nominal, you don't have a deemed dividend and you need not do anything further. If, like scenario one, the amount exceeds the de minimis amount, we then look to what is called the full inclusion rule, which says if the sum of the gross foreign-based company income, again, before expenses, and the gross insurance income for the taxable year is greater than 70% of the CFC's gross income, then all gross income earned by that CFC for the year is deemed subpart F. So again, with our example, if CFC has foreign-based company income of 525,000 and gross income of 600,000, $600,000 times 70% equals 420,000. Since our $525,000 is more than 420,000, the full 600,000 earned by the CFC in this example in the year will be considered foreign-based company income, not just the 525 that was identified. Once we determine our gross subpart F income amount after applying both the de minimis and full inclusion rules, the next step is to compute the net foreign-based company income by allocating and apportioning expenses, including taxes, 
properly allocable to such income. If an expense is not related to all gross income classes, it's first allocated in a portion to those categories to which it relates using principles under IRC section 861. There is an exception for interest expense paid to related parties. Such an expense is first allocated to passive income if any exists before being prorated to other income. And then finally, all other expenses are allocated in the portion among all the classes of income using our 861 principles. Let's assume a foreign company has 1.5 million of gross income. The company purchases goods from a related party and sells mainly to customers in its own country. However, out of the 1.5 million, $300,000 of the income actually relates to sales to a customer in another country, and $75,000 of income relates to interest. The company determines that the 300,000 of income is foreign-based company sales income, and the 75,000 of interest income is passive. Their sub F does not meet any of the exceptions. It does not meet the de minimis test, we know this, because 1.5 million times 5% is 75,000. Um, so our 375 is more, so we don't meet de minimis. And if we look at the full inclusion rule, 70% times 1.5 million is 1,050,000. So we are in the full inclusion rule. So our 375 is less than that, and we are limited to just including the 375. To determine our net foreign-based company income, Assume the company has $725,000 of expenses, including $34,000 of interest expense paid to a related party. We are now going to allocate in a portion of those expenses to our income, our gross income that's determined after all of our exceptions. The $34,000 of interest expense will be directly allocated the passive interest income of $75,000. It is determined that the 691,000 of other expenses relates to all categories of income. Since we know this, we're going to apportion it using the method under 861. For this example, let's go ahead and assume the allocation is based on gross income is an appropriate method. So after allocating the 691 based on all the gross incomes in relation to the 1.5 million, we get a net amount of 606,750 of non sub F, 161,800 of foreign personal holding company income, and 6,450 of foreign personal holding company passive income. The net income loss in each category remains for purposes of determining the characterization of the inclusion for foreign tax credit purposes as well as the high tax exception. So we do need these in the various buckets to keep track. Once this com CFC computes its subpart F by class, the actual deemed dividend inclusion of such amount may still be limited if the CFC's ESP is less than or negative for the year. This limitation, contained in 952C, is known as the current year ENP limitation. Again, looking at our example, let's instead assume expenses allocated and apportioned to non sub F income is. 1,218,250. So in this instance, our subpart F income is 168,250, the sum of both the general and passive basket. But our ENP limitation says that we only have an inclusion up to 75,000 of the current year amount. So what is ENP? ENP stands for earnings and profits. It's not defined in the Internal Revenue Code. But instead, it's an economic concept meant to reflect the amount of funds available for distribution by a legal entity. Since sub F creates a deemed dividend, the theory is that if there's not enough earnings to make a real distribution, then a deemed one also can't exist or should be limited. Relevant adjustments for determining earnings and profits are provided in Internal Revenue Code Sections 312 and 1.964-1. And I'll discuss those in another video coming shortly. So you may be wondering, if ENP is negative, could the computation of sub-F just be ignored for the year? The rules for sub-F require year-by-year -year tracking. If the sub-F deemed inclusion for a year was reduced as a result of an ENP limitation, then in future years, if there's future positive non-subpart F type income, you may have to recapture 
that old sabbath that you were limited by. So you can have these aha moments where you have an inclusions that you hadn't anticipated due to past events. It's important that companies maintain cumulative documentation to ensure that the sub-F inclusions are not unintentionally missed due to the EMP limitation in a prior year. The only way to do so would be to know what the amount would have been if there was no limit, which is why we have to track it annually. Once net income by class is computed, the regulations provide an optional step. This step is known as the high tax exception. It's optional since a company can elect or not elect to apply the exception. If the exception is applied, generally the foreign-based company income and insurance income are not to be subpart F income if the income at that CFC is subject to an effective rate of income tax imposed by a foreign country greater than 90% of the U.S. tax rate. So in other words, they're saying if the income is being earned in a jurisdiction with a relatively high tax rate, like the U.S., then you probably weren't trying to shift it there to reduce your overall tax liability, so you're allowed to accept that income. With the U.S. current tax rate of 21%, the effective rate of a country needs to be 90% times 21% or 18.9%. A change to the U.S. statutory rate, like the one currently be discussed at this video by the Biden administration of 28%, changes the exception to 25.2%. And if we consider the old U.S. tax rate that was 35% prior to the TCJA, that amount would be 31.5%. So as the U.S. rate has decreased over time, the threshold to exclude certain foreign-based company income as sub F by applying the high tax exception has become actually easier to meet. And so more and more companies should be able to elect this exception moving forward. The effective tax rate is computed with respect to each category of income of the CFC. So you can't just do it on a total CFC basis. You actually have to do it by category and income. We would look at the ETR of the general and foreign personal holding company category, and then the passive foreign personal holding company category separately, like in our example. An election is also made on a CFC by CFC basis, and you can change it annually. Section 951A, the newer anti-deferral regime, also known as guilty, has a high tax exception election. It's expected that the additional sub F regs which will be passed providing for consistent application of the rules between the two going forward and will be addressed in a future video. So after going through all of our sets, steps, the net subpart F amount computed and not limited by ENP, in this case 161.8 and 6450, is included as a deemed dividend in the U.S. return. This amount is shown on Form 5471, Schedule I, for each CFC, and the total amounts of all sub F are included on page 2 of the 1120 as a dividend. Subpart F income in the past was a provision many companies navigated around, ensuring for the most part their income streams did not fall into a category of foreign-based company income. Keeping tracking and computation is minimal. In December of 2017, Congress added a new provision, the 951A guilty regime. What I want to note here is that with this newer provision, companies can no longer work to avoid calculating subpart F, and in some instances may find it more beneficial than detrimental to their overall tax posture to use it. Understanding how structure changes can impact revenue flows, how exceptions may be applied, and how rules like the de minimis and full inclusion impact a sub-F inclusion will help tax departments model out and utilize subpart F as a tax strategy going forward.